and then pray, Clay will come and preach to us. Father, we bow before you, thanking you for this good day, for this place that we can come together and worship you and learn from you. We thank you for Clay and Jessica and their good family. We thank you for his years of devotion to preaching your word and uh, honing his skills and becoming effective in that uh, endeavor. And we just uh, thank you for his friendship. We thank you for his association here with this congregation and for the great privilege of him coming and preaching your word to us this uh, week. We pray that you be with all those who are sick. We'll uh, talk some more about them in the worship hour, but we appreciate uh, your blessings upon them. And uh, we pray that you strengthen them and be with the doctors that are making decisions in their care. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm short, what can I say? <laughs> good morning. It's good to be with you on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. I'm excited for this opportunity to gather with God's people and open His book. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. We get to hear from God every time we open this book. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be associated with this congregation. As I look back on the 10 years in central Kentucky and Paris, and uh, the work that we've been able to do there, but also in thinking especially about the years of association with the Bible camp here that began actually in 2012 when I was an intern in Frankfort, Kentucky, um, but uh, became uh, much more regular when we began the Christian Leadership Instructional Camp in 2018. And then in 2022, to take uh, another leap of faith, if you will, and to expand that into a year-long program, Youth Life, uh, which has been a blessing to me, and I pray a blessing to you all and to the young people especially who are a part of it. So I'm excited to be here with you. You don't know how much you mean to me. If you've got your Bibles and you want to open up, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Many of us learned how to write letters when we were in school. We were taught the proper conventions of address and introduction and body and conclusion and salutation. And uh, with the rise of instant messaging, message boards, emails, text messaging, many of those formal conventions that we learned have gone by the wayside. Uh, they were sacrificed on the altar of speed and on informality. But who could deny the simple pleasure of receiving a piece of written correspondence from another human being? With the rise of rapid-fire technology and informal communication, I would suggest that written correspondence has also increased in value. I mean, just think about how it makes you feel to receive a real piece of mail from someone else. Not a chain letter, not an advertisement, but a real, I sat down and took some time out of my day and thought about you piece of mail. So even if some of the conventions have gone by the wayside, the value of the letter has staying power. And as we open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we find a letter by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. And this letter is written according to first century letter writing convention. Maybe not exactly what we learned in school, but certainly following a particular format, especially in the introduction, except that Paul has Christianized the letter-writing form. And so he introduces himself, and he also introduces someone who is with him by the name of Sosthenes. And Sosthenes may be the very same Sosthenes who was converted in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, verse 17. 
and is likely as well Paul's scribe. I want you to think for a moment about what it meant for Paul to write a letter in the first century. Paper was not easily available the way that it is now. You couldn't go to the store and buy a pack of hundreds of sheets of paper for a a, a low sum. It was pretty costly, and ink as well was difficult to procure. And then, if you're Paul, you also utilize a scribe because for some reason he's not able to write very well, at least not from what we can see in passages like the end of Galatians. And then, not only have you gone to the trouble and the expense of hiring a scribe and securing paper and ink, but you've got to find someone to deliver that letter. There are no uniform mail services in the first century, at least not for private citizens. So you've got to find someone who's going to be in the vicinity of your recipients and whom you trust enough to carry your correspondence. So what a blessing it is that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and we have a record of it today. He follows conventional letter-writing practices in the greeting, introducing himself and Sosthenes, also identifying his recipients, the congregation at Corinth, and he gives thanks in the opening of the letter. So there is an address and there is a thanksgiving, and that thanksgiving serves a couple of purposes. Number one, it praises God for all of His goodness and what He has done. But it also gives us a preview of the way that Paul in this letter is going to address some issues that exist in Corinth and in his relationship with the church in Corinth. It also gives us a little bit of insight into where Paul is going with regard to what some call eschatology, the end times. Now, we don't use language like that, so let's put it simply. Paul talks about what God has already accomplished in Jesus Christ, but also what God is going to bring to completion through Jesus Christ. And this as well is going to address some of the issues in Corinth. Now, instead of talking it to death, let's actually read what Paul has said to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1-9. through 9, And I'm using the ESV. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him, in all speech and all knowledge, so that you are not lacking in any gift. But the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you as you wait for the revealing of our Lord, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but if you look at those nine verses, Paul says a lot in a short space. And what I'd like to do in this period is consider three areas of emphasis in which Paul instructs the church in Corinth and by proxy us today as well. So let us learn from these verses first about the church. Let us learn, second, about the Christian. And finally, let us learn about the Christ. First of all, let's see what Paul is teaching about the church in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. He teaches, first of all, that the church exists because Jesus called and commissioned His apostles. He says, Paul, he introduces himself, called by the will of God, to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. It is because God had a plan that He enacted in Jesus Christ that involved not only Jesus' sacrifice of Himself and the teaching and healing ministry that He performed for three years, but also in the training of apostles that the church exists. Paul says, I was called to be an apostle. Now, there are three callings in these nine verses, and this is the first calling. It is an apostolic calling. Paul is able to say, in Act, or rather, in Acts chapter 9, God tells Ananias, 
You're going to go to this man, Paul, and he's going to be my chosen mouthpiece to the Gentiles. So the church exists because God, through Jesus Christ, trained and called apostles who went into all the world and proclaimed the gospel. I don't know if we realize how important that is. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 that the New Testament prophets and apostles are the foundation of God's church. So the church exists, we see in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, because Jesus trained, called, and commissioned, that is, sent out apostles with his message. But second of all, see that the church not only exists because Jesus commissioned apostles, but it also belongs to God. He says, to the church of God in Corinth. The New Testament uses a number of different descriptions of the church. And all of these descriptions emphasize different aspects of the character and nature of the church. And the one that Paul uses here emphasizes that the church belongs to God. He says, to the church of God. It's not a title. There, in fact, is no single title for the church in the New Testament. And I would say, beware of anyone who would attempt to apply a title to the church. But we can describe it in many different ways according to Scripture. One of these is the church of God. It belongs to God. Paul told the elders from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, that God purchased the church with His blood. And so he says, to the church of God in Corinth, it belongs to God. That means, by the way, which is very important in Corinth, it doesn't belong to men. And as you look around at the religious world today and the way that some people are doing church, you have to ask if they understand that it doesn't belong to men, but it belongs to God. So we see that the church exists because Christ sent out apostles bearing His message. We see that the church exists in uh, possession of God, but it also exists locally. He says to the church of God in Corinth. It is by God's design and God's plan that His people would exist in little pockets throughout the world as His lighthouses. Paul does not write a letter in this case to Jerusalem or to Rome or to Ephesus. He writes a letter to Corinth, to Christians who live in a particular place. And in that place, they have certain temptations and challenges surrounding them. And we can learn from this letter, we should learn from this letter, is by God's providence and wisdom that we have access to it. But we need to remember that it was not written to us first. It was written to Christians in Corinth who had a responsibility to represent the glory of God to their city. Now think about what that means for us and for you right here in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. That as the church of God in Mount Sterling, you have a responsibility. And while we're going to talk in just a moment about the global brotherhood, there is a sense in which your first priority in going into all the world is going into Mount Sterling and being the people of God who represent God in Mount Sterling. Now the problem in Corinth was they were not only in Corinth, but in the church there, Corinth was in them. They had bought into some worldliness that was a part of their culture and their society in that city a city that was made up largely of what we might call up-and-comers. It was a city that allowed for greater, greater social mobility than most ancient cities. And so there were people there who had come from nothing and they had gained great wealth and they thought that they were somebodies. And they thought that because they were allowing their culture to influence them too much. So while they were in Corinth, and they were to be God's people in Corinth, Corinth was not to be in them. And so Paul says, not only you're the church of God in Corinth, but you're sanctified. So we see the church exists by God's design. It belongs to God. It exists locally. Ah, but it's not to be of the world. He says, you're sanctified. What does that mean? You're set apart. You're to be holy 
The language is reminiscent of what we find in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, where Moses tells the children of Israel that God has chosen you to be a people for His possession. That is, you're not to be like the other people around you. You you have a special purpose. And when we look at the way that Moses, led by God, talks about the instruments that are to be used in the tabernacle in the latter part of the book of Exodus, they're consistently described as holy. That means they've been set apart for a very special use. And Paul says to the Christians in Corinth, to the church, you have been sanctified, called to be saints. That means holy ones. You have been set apart for special use. So while you may be in a community and you have a responsibility to be the people of God in that community, you're not to be like that community. You're to be like God. Because God is the one who is eminently holy. He is the one whom we imitate and whom we are made like when we are called holy. So the church exists in Corinth because of apostolic work, led by Jesus, it exists locally, it is owned by God, it is set apart from the world, but Paul is quick to point out, in addition to all of these things, you're not the only ones. Because he says, you're called to be saints together with all those who call upon the name. Now there's the other two callings, by the way. We saw that apostolic calling in verse 1. The second calling is the calling of the gospel that Jesus makes, we'll talk about, Uh, when we get to verses uh, uh, 4 through 9. But then there's also the calling that we make upon God. Those who call upon God, that is, those who ask God to save them. And so he says, you are Christians in Corinth, but you're not the only Christians. There are others who are calling upon the name of the Lord as well. This was very important because there was an attitude at Corinth that somehow maybe we're better than everyone else. We have arrived spiritually. We have found heaven on earth, if you will. And Paul says, don't forget, you're not the only ones. You're not the only ones who have received God's gifts. You're not the only church that exists in the world. We have great opportunities here in central Kentucky to recognize and enjoy the fellowship of other Christians. Uh, Even in in recent uh, months and years, we've begun to do more activities along that line. We have now this monthly singing and this quarterly fellowship to emphasize our unity. And these are great opportunities that we have as the people of God to recognize that the local congregation is not the only body of believers in the world. Sometimes we get the Elijah attitude. You know, I'm the only one. There's nobody else who's faithful. And God says, wait a minute, there's, there's several thousand who have not bowed the knee. Now the world wants us to unite on the wrong basis, and we're going to talk about that in the worship hour, but it is true that we are not the only Christians in the world. And we need to take time to recognize, appreciate, and celebrate the fact that God is saving people all over the world. And that means in the broader fellowship that we have with Churches of Christ here in Central Kentucky, it also means in the way that we might support missionaries and evangelists who are throughout the world preaching the same gospel that Paul preached and made Christians in Corinth in the first century. So we learned several truths about the church, and before we go into the next point, I just want to encourage you, be the church! Be the church! Be people who are called out of the world into Christ in Mount Sterling, recognizing Christians who are also outside of these walls. Be the church, understanding that you have gifts that God has given to you as the body of Christ that no one else in the world can enjoy. Only Christians have those gifts. And be the church, using your gifts to glorify God and not men. Be the church, this one is so important in today's world, according to God's plan and design and under His ownership and not under that of any man or group of people. Be the church. Second of all, let's learn about the Christian. 
Paul says, first of all, in verse 4, that a Christian is someone who has received God's grace. He says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you. I'm going to make a very bold, absolute statement. There is no Christian at any point in time, at any place in the world, who is a Christian because of his own or her own merit. A Christian, by definition, is someone who receives what he or she could not obtain for himself or herself. Paul says, I give thanks that you received God's grace. It was given to you. It was a gift. It was according to God's generosity. Now, there's a way in which we must receive it. God has defined that. But there's no cause for boasting if you're a Christian, except in the Lord. That's where Paul's going, by the way, in this letter. But a Christian is someone who has received God's grace, who has understood that I have nothing that I can bring to satisfy the situation that exists between me and God. Therefore, I need what God has secured in His Son. And I receive that as a gift, not as a wage. So a Christian is someone who is a beneficiary of God's grace. As we move down into verses 5 through 7, we also see that Christians are enabled and empowered to do God's work. Now in Corinth, this meant that they had so many gifts that they were arguing over which miraculous gift was best. And there were two that they were really emphasizing, and Paul alludes to them here. He says, of speech and knowledge, or of utterance and knowledge. And these gifts became serious issues in Corinth. And Paul's going to spend a great deal of time, especially in the latter portion of the letter, dealing with how they ought to view these gifts. But it is true that in Corinth, God had enriched Christians with gifts for the building up of the church. That's our theme this week. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12, with regard to spiritual gifts, so with yourselves, strive to excel in building up the church. We understand that in the first century, the Bible was not yet completed, that God was using during this period of infancy in the church miraculous gifts to confirm His message and to instruct His people. We also understand that living now in the 21st century, the time of those gifts has long ceased since the time of the apostles. And yet, it is still true that God gives gifts to His people for the building up of His church. They may not be miraculous in nature, but they're still edifying. And some have the gift of being well-read. Some have the gift of being encouragers. Some have the gift of being good leaders. We could go on and on. But it is still true today that God gives gifts to His people, talents that we possess that we ought to use first and foremost for the building up of His church, for His glory, for the growth of His kingdom. And so a Christian is someone who is a recipient of God's grace. A Christian is someone who has been enriched by God and His gifts. A Christian is someone who has been called, who has been set apart from the world. We talked about the church being that way. It's true of the individual Christian as well. And a Christian is someone who has called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. In just a moment, we'll talk about how we do that. But then, verse 7, a Christian is someone who is looking for Christ's return. He says, as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone has said that we are a peculiarly minded people. I had to practice that word, peculiarly. It doesn't roll off the tongue like you would like. Why is it that we are a peculiarly minded people? We think differently from the world because we're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. And if you know that the judge is coming, you want to be ready. But also, if you know that this world is not all that there is, you also have a real change in your values. We are looking for the return of the Lord. Well, we should be, are you? Is that thought on your mind on a regular basis? How often do you think about the truth that Jesus is going to return? I didn't say He might. He is going to return. Now, we don't know when. The Bible's plain on that point. 
So could it be in my lifetime or the lifetime of my children or the lifetime of my great-grandchildren? It could be. But if it could be in my lifetime, I need to be ready. And if I have the right mindset as one who is a recipient of God's grace, I will. In fact, Paul goes on to say, not only are you looking for his revealing, but he says in verse 8, he will sustain you to the end. Now what's a bit interesting is if you look back in verse 6, it says that the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. That's the ESV. And then in verse 8, he says, He will sustain you to the end. In the original language, confirm and sustain are the same word. So the same one who confirmed that Jesus is the Lord God, He is the Christ, when Paul preached the gospel at Corinth, will also confirm His people to the end. That doesn't mean we can't walk away. In fact, God would be a liar if we couldn't walk away since he says, I don't know how many times in the New Testament, don't fall away. If it's impossible, God's not being very honest with us, is he? But we can be confident. He says he will confirm you to the end. What that really means is that our expectation of Jesus' return and our confidence for that day is not built upon our perfection, but upon His promises. And we sometimes struggle with that in the Lord's church because we hear people that uh, will take this too far. And then we end up in a place where people are doubting that they could ever be saved. Because if I make a mistake, all of a sudden now I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out. That's not the way it works. He says He's going to confirm you to the end. If you're walking in the light as he is in the light, John says, you have fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ covers those failures. So he's going to confirm you. You can be confident. It's not just that we're looking for the revealing of Jesus Christ, but we can look for it with joy and anticipation and excitement and confidence because of God's goodness towards us. Because God has given us gifts that we could not earn on our own. And so we look confidently. And then verse 9, Christians are people who have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. He says, God has called you into fellowship with His Son. Isn't that a blessing? God made it possible for you to be His friend. Do you know the value of a good friend? There's no friend like Jesus. A Christian is someone who is in fellowship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's be Christians. Let's be people who understand that we have nothing to bring and everything to gain through what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. But also let's be people who are looking with confidence and anticipation and expectation for the day that Jesus will come back. He will declare Himself the ruler of all for all time and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and we will celebrate. Let's be people who are looking for that return with confidence in fellowship with one another through Jesus Christ. People who have boldness to come into the presence of God, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, because of Jesus' faith and submission to the Father. Let's be Christians. Then last but not least, let's see what Paul teaches us about the Christ. As we back up to the beginning of this book, and we look at the number of times that Jesus refer, or Paul refers to Jesus, he uses the term Lord Jesus, Christ, Son, and at least one pronoun reference to Jesus in nine verses. Now, several of these are in clusters. He'll say, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are 25 references to Jesus in nine verses. Now, again, some of those are in clusters of three. But what we might expect, based on what we're going to find as we continue reading the letter, is that Paul would spend some time talking about himself, Because there are some problems in Corinth. And some of those problems actually come back to the relationship that Paul has with these Christians. And the human tendency would be to come out swinging, defending oneself. 
But Paul doesn't come out talking about himself. He comes out talking about Jesus. And he says Jesus is the one who sanctifies. So we talked about that sanctification with regard to the church and to the Christian, and it is Jesus who sanctifies. It is Jesus who makes us holy. And he does this by the sacrifice of himself, by offering himself on the cross for our sins, so that in spite of our sins and imperfections, God can look upon us and see us as he is, as holy, holy, holy. Because when we come on our own, we're like Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips, Isaiah chapter 6. But he sees a God who is holy, holy, holy. But what Jesus does is makes it possible for God to look upon us and say, that's a holy one. But not only does he sanctify his people, setting them apart, but Paul says he is the one who calls us. And how does he do that? He does it through the gospel. He writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, We ought to give thanks to God always for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Listen to verse 14. To this He called you through our gospel, that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how does God call us? He calls us through the gospel. He calls us through the gospel. There's no special calling. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing. How's God going to call you? He's not going to whisper in your ear. But Jesus is inviting all people. He says in John 12, verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all people to myself. How does He call us? He calls us through what He's done on the, on the cross. He invites us in the gospel, in His life, His death, His resurrection and ascension, He invites us into fellowship with God. That invitation is available to everyone. So He calls us, but He also answers when we call upon Him. Because you notice we saw three callings, the special apostolic calling in verse 1, the calling of Jesus through the gospel, but there's also this calling of those who call upon His name. In Acts chapter 2, After Jesus has ascended, the apostles receive a special anointing of the Holy Spirit, and Peter stands up to defend and explain what is taking place, and he takes as his base text, Joel chapter 2. And in Acts 2.21, he quotes from Joel, and he says, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, you go on and you read the rest of the chapter and what you find out is there were people who were present who said, what do we got to do? Does Peter say, call upon the name of the Lord? Just say a prayer? No, that's not what he says. He says, repent and be baptized. This is Acts 2, 37 and 38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. How do you call upon the name of the Lord? Well, apparently, you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. In Acts chapter 2, Paul is standing up. He's talking about his own experience. He met the Lord on the road to Damascus, and the Lord sent Ananias to him. And in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Paul tells us what Ananias said to him. Now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon His name. How do we call upon the Lord? How do we call upon the name of the Lord? Well, in faith, repentance, confession, we are immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But here's what's so beautiful. Jesus answers that call. Jesus responds when we call upon His name by washing away our sins through the power of the regeneration of the Spirit Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He makes us new. So Jesus not only calls us through the gospel, but He hears when we call upon Him and ask Him to save us in the way that He has told us to do. Peter calls it an appeal in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. An appeal for a good conscience. We're calling upon the name of the Lord. So Jesus sets His people apart. He calls through the gospel. He answers our calls. He empowers His people with the gifts that we've already discussed. He also 
is coming back. And he gives us the confidence that we need for that return. We talked about that. And he mediates for us. It's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He mediates for us. We're in fellowship with the Son, and if we're in fellowship with the Son, we're in fellowship with the Father. In the early 2000s, the late Toby Keith had a hit on the radio, I want to talk about me. He said, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about number one, oh my, me, my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, want to see. I like to talk about you, 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 usually, but occasionally I want to talk about me. Now, that's not goofy. It stuck in my mind because I was in elementary school when it came out. I just dated myself. It may be representative of the way that we think as a society that that song got so popular. But on an occasion in which Paul is dealing with personal attacks, he doesn't want to talk about me. He wants to talk about Christ. And it's important for us to understand to miss Christ is to miss it all. That's true for the non-believer and for the Christian as well. As we begin to close down this lesson, I just want you to think about everything that we have discussed and how it all comes back to Jesus. There's nothing that the church has except that it came through Jesus Christ. There's no gift that the Christian possesses except that it came through Jesus Christ. And there is nothing upon which the church should focus or the Christian should focus that shouldn't be leading us ultimately to Jesus Christ. Because without Him we are nothing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for passages like 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. The way in which you have revealed yourself to us and preserved that revelation so that we might know you and your truth. Father, we thank you for your church, for the opportunity that we have as the church to be your people in local communities, but also to go into all the world and reach the lost and recognize brothers and sisters wherever we are. Father, we thank you for individual Christians. We know that each one is, is valued and precious in your sight. That the value of one soul was enough to enact the plan that you did in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has called us through the gospel and who will answer when we call in response to that gospel. Father, bless us. Help us to keep our eyes on you and your son to wait expectantly for his return and in the meantime to do everything that we can to bring glory to you. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed until worship.